From Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Dollar. Johnny, I've got it for you. Lou Tang. Good. What did you find out? That prices on the Tokyo grain market did break suddenly, about three weeks ago. Three weeks. Uh-huh. Reason, oversupply. The price has been holding since at about 60% of the peak. A 40% drop, big enough to cause the damage. What damage? The sinking of the Molly K, a double cross, a frame-up, murder. It's as clear as crystal, Lou. Come see me later tonight. Tell me all about it. All right. Or at any rate, come and tell me about something. About a certain night in Paris, maybe? I think I'd like that very much, Johnny. Wait for me, Lou. I'll be there later. You can count on it. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location San Francisco, to the Home Office Marine and Maritime Casualty Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Molly K matter. Expense account, final page. Item 9, 770, long-distance calls to Hartford and New York. I was pretty sure before I called, but I had to check on it. It checked. Item 10, 80 cents, taxi from my hotel to the waterfront office of Inspector Dan McKay, Harbor Police. Uh, It's a funny deal, Johnny. I can't figure. Captain Brawley has clammed up tight. Won't answer any more questions. Doesn't want a lawyer. Won't even talk. It's a funny deal. Not when you consider the fact that he's innocent. What? What you say? I know. I argued the opposite. I was wrong, Dan. What is it, Johnny? Just plain stubbornness? No, but that's what it is with Captain Brawley. Maybe that's the tip-off, his stubborn bullheadedness. The human elements you mentioned. How are you figuring it? If Brawley were in a money jam, he'd never scheme and connive at planning a thing like that of sinking his own ship. He's too stubborn. And besides, he wasn't in a jam. I'm sure of it. Well, now, now, wait a minute. He had a $100,000 mortgage to meet. I finagled some information out of the bank. The Brawley Shipping Company has a free balance of nearly $150,000 in cash assets. Yeah, but look here, Johnny. Now, you look. I started out with a motive, and I built a pretty strong case on it. Even you agreed. Everything pointed toward Captain Brawley. Sure, because somebody was helping things point toward him. What do you mean? It wasn't just the ship itself that was insured. I'm still lost, Johnny. Keep talking. All right, look. That cargo of grain was also insured by the owner with another company, not mine. And for top market value, full price. Yeah, well, keep talking. All right. The Tokyo grain market broke just four days before the Molly K was due to sail the first time. The shipper stood to lose nearly half his investment if the grain reached Yokohama at that time. Well, it didn't reach there. It's lying out there on the bottom of the Pacific. Net result, instead of taking a loss because of price, the shipper gets full price from the insurance company. It adds up, Dan. Yeah, it sure does. The shipper. I think Captain Brawley suspected him, too. That's what kept the old captain on the prod. The ship gone, under suspicion for the sinking, yet not wanting to hurt his daughter. He was caught right in the middle. But keep on holding him to make it look like we still think he's the guilty party. Well, it's that girl of his I feel sorry for, Ellen. She's the one caught in the middle. Yeah, I know. And it's going to be rough on her when she finds out. Engaged to a killer who's been using her to smash her own father. Great setup. Yeah. Well, I'll get a bullet now. We'll pick up this Dean Sutton and bring him in. But you know something? It's going to be awful hard to pin it on him. Need evidence, something definite. Look, why don't you let me have a go on him first? It's out of the question, Johnny. Of course, if you should happen to find him before we do... Well, yeah, yeah. I might just do that, Dan. In fact, I've kind of got a hunch I will. It was a hunch, but it might be a good one. I left Dan's office and walked east along the waterfront, following the long curve of the Embarcadero with its miles of docks and wharves. The night had settled down over the bay in the city, and with it a dark, damp blanket of fog, even heavier than the night before. And because of that and other reasons, I felt cold and lonesome and alone. I turned off the Embarcadero and walked out Pier 29. I was about 30 yards from the Brawley warehouse when I was suddenly brought up short. On the water below me, tied to a wharf piling, was a light cabin cruiser rocking gently with a swell. It had no business being there. Pier 29 was a commercial berth. 
My hunch was right. I moved quietly to the edge of the wharf and stood watching the little cruiser for several minutes. There was no sign of life, no sound. Finally, I climbed over the dock rail, down the wharf ladder, and stepped onto the deck. Still no sound, no movement. I moved over to the companionway door leading down below decks and reached out my hand for the latch. Then I stopped short, caught suddenly by a sharp feeling of danger. It wasn't a sense of being watched. It was deeper, more subtle, more vague. I tried to shake it off, reach again for the latch. Then the boat shifted slightly, and the dim glow from the wharf light overhead moved across the hatchway door. Inches in front of my face, I saw the glint of bare copper wires, all set to make contact if the door was open. One more move, and I'd have been blown sky high. That boat was booby-trapped. There was a light burning in the office of the Brawley Shipping Company. I knocked on the door, drew my gun, then I stepped back and waited. I leveled the gun on the door. Johnny! Are you alone, Ellen? Yes, of course. Well, come on, let's get inside. What is it, Johnny? Have you seen Dean Sutton tonight? I tried to find him, but I couldn't. My father's been arrested, charged with murder. Yeah, I know, honey. I came here to go over the company records to see if I could find something that might help him, anything. Ellen, I... Johnny, uh... look. Look at this mess. Somebody's been here. Files dumped in the middle of the floor, papers all over the place. Yeah, it looks like they're planning to start a bonfire. Say, tell me something, Ellen. Does Dean Sutton own a boat? Yes. Light cabin cruiser named the Piper. Why? It's tied up at the wharf. He's around here somewhere. Well, what of it? I... What do you mean? Your father didn't sink the Molly Kay. Dean Sutton did it. But he wasn't even on board. He didn't have to be. He hired an explosive expert named Benny Wong to do the job. He got your father to take Benny on as steward. But that's the man they're accusing father of murder. Dean is the one who did it, using your father's gun. But why? To collect the insurance on that cargo of grain. Oh, look, I know it's a rough deal, honey, and I know how you feel. But I guess your best bet is to chalk it up to experience. At least your father's in the clear now. I think I sensed it, Johnny. That something was wrong with Dean. Badly wrong. I guess that's why I felt like turning to you instead of him. Why I still feel that way. I think I'm going to cry. Then cry. Cry it out and get it over with. Come here, Ellen. I held her close and tried to comfort her. She pressed her face against my chest and whimpered like a hurt kid. I kept stroking her hair, breathing in the scent of her perfume. Perfume? The same perfume that had hung in the air of the room where Benny Wong was killed. The pieces shifted, fell into place again. The puzzle was finally solved, but too late. Because I could feel the muzzle of the gun she was pressing against my side. Easy now, Johnny. Turn around slow and get your hands up. That's the idea. Now stay that way. I'm a dead shot, Johnny. If you doubt it, ask Benny Wong. Right under my nose. Right from the start. How wrong can a guy be? As wrong as you were, Johnny. It had to be you. There was no chance for Dean to steal your father's gun and then return it. Not unless you were in on it with him. It was my idea. Dean's too weak to plan a thing like that. He has to be propped up and pushed. And you're just the girl to do it. You ought to know. Yeah, I do now. It's too bad. I like the way you kiss. Any chance of working something out, Johnny? Or are you too honest? So that's it. The next step is to get rid of Dean. And you've already got the trap set. Not yet. But I'll think of something. I'm clever, Johnny. Don't you think so? I heard footsteps coming along the wharf. Dean Sutton. I had only seconds to think of something, so I took a chance, edged back against the wall, inched over closer to the door. That's far enough. Don't push your luck. There's Dean coming now. He went after some gasoline. We're going to build a nice warm fire, and you're going to have a ringside seat. Come on in, Dean. We've got a visitor. Uh, Dollar. What do you know? So you walked right into it. Just like a cop. Chance paid off. He walked between us, blocked Ellen's line of fire, and I jumped him. I grabbed him around the neck, held him as a shield, dragged him back out through the door, out to the wharf. Dean! Break loose! Let me get a shot at him! I was trying to get clear of the light before Ellen could blast me with that gun, and I made it. But Dean broke loose, came at me swinging. He slipped and staggered up against the dock rail. The railing broke, split and threw, and we went over the side. 
We struggled back up to the surface. Dean's hands were clenched on my throat, and I couldn't break his grip. <laughs> Ellen started firing from the wharf above us, not knowing who she'd hit and not caring. I took a deep breath and dragged Dean under the surface. But his hands were still on my throat, and I couldn't break loose. My lungs were bursting. My strength was going fast. I brought up my knee. <laughs> he fell away from me. I was free, free to fight my way back up to the surface. I swam around in circles, getting my breath, watching for Dean. But he didn't come up. He didn't come up for two days. When I climbed up the ladder onto the wharf, Ellen was nowhere in sight. I heard somebody running toward me, saw the flashing red light back at the land end of the pier, and I knew why she'd left. Dan McKay and his boys. Hey, Johnny! Hey, over here, Dan. Are you all right, Johnny? Yeah, I'm all right. Do you see Ellen Brawley? Well, some girl ran up the wharf there, tore that cruiser. That boat's got a booby trap on it. Come on, Dan. All right. What's she doing here? She was in on it, too. Dean's in the water, drowned, I guess. Look, there she is, climbing down off the wharf. Ellen, stop. She's on the cruiser. No. Ellen! She's gonna try... Look out! Get down! Flat on your face. If she opens that hand... Blown to bits. Booby trap. They had it rigged for me, and she... No... She didn't know about it. That wasn't meant for me. They were both pulling a double cross. Dean set that trap for her. End of expense account, except hotel and plane fare back home. Total $547.60. Well, it looks like the company pays off on this one, Dave. The ship owner was innocent. But you'll make it back. I really feel sorry for Captain Brawley. He commanded his own quarter deck for 25 years. Strong and proud and unafraid. He had a wife once named Molly Kay and a ship named Molly Kay. And he had a daughter, too. And now the sea has taken all of them away from him and left him cast up on the beach, a broken old man. Bitter, beaten, alone. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star, Bob Bailey, to tell you about next week's story. Thanks. Next week, the case of a man who didn't exist, except for one thing. He suddenly showed up. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, the entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Virginia Gregg, Peter Leeds, Barney Phillips, Victor Perrin, James McCallion, and High Aberback. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs> 